Birmingham in the 18th century. Nothing stood still for long. Change was in the air, the old order was being questioned, and thousands of trades were being conducted in hundreds of family-owned workshops. The spirit of experimentation was everywhere, and the word new caused excitement, not fear. Men with exceptional minds and sharp intellects were being attracted to Birmingham and the opportunities the town offered. When they arrived, they sought out one another to exchange ideas and to revel in the challenges of invention and discovery. These were men of the real world, businessmen, engineers and doctors, who came together not in places of formal education or fashionable salons, but in homes and taverns to talk, dispute and learn. One such group, the Lunar Society, would become world famous and would be remembered for centuries. They were simply friends who reveled in each other's intellects and who agreed to meet when the full moon would light their way home safely. But what an exceptional group of friends the Lunar Society became. At its heart was Matthew Bolton, who built the world famous Soho Manufactory. His steam engines supplied the power to drive the Industrial Revolution. He was a modern entrepreneur, full of energy and brimming with new ideas. James Watt came from Scotland to become Bolton's partner in the search to perfect the steam engine. Fretful and meticulous, his innovation would help to make both men very rich. Erasmus Darwin, a well-known doctor from nearby Lichfield, binds the group together. Rotund and jovial, his botanical observations established the foundation of the theory of evolution. Also joining them is Joseph Priestley, the dissenting preacher and chemist who isolates oxygen, but whose radical views help to ignite riots in the town. Other thinkers and friends are drawn to the group. Josiah Wedgwood, the master potter. Dr. William Small, physician and mathematician. The clockmaker, John Whitehurst, who becomes a father of geology. And William Withering, who discovered digitalis. But where do we find these lunar men in Birmingham today? The new lunar trail created by the modern Lunar Society and Birmingham Museums Trust will show us the way. Let's begin at Sarehole Mill, beside the River Cole, where we can glimpse the world into which the lunar men were born. It was a world where for millennia industry had to rely on the uncertain power of the water wheel. Matthew Bolton had a water-driven metal rolling mill here, but he would devote much of the rest of his life to harnessing the reliable power of steam. Matthew was born the son of a manufacturer of toys, small decorative objects that made Birmingham famous. He was christened in 1728 at the then new St. Philip's Church perched above the old town. St. Philip's later became the city's cathedral to which four magnificent stained glass windows by the great pre-Raphaelite artist Sir Edward Burne-Jones were added. We also find a memorial to Dr. William Small, one of the initial members of the Lunar Society. He was one of the founders of the Birmingham General Hospital, but died before it opened. The Lunar Trail now takes us to Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, where a permanent exhibition includes the story of the 18th century town in which the Lunar men lived and worked. In an adjacent gallery hangs the portrait of Erasmus Darwin. This hugely likeable Lichfield doctor was at the centre of the Lunar Society. Constantly conducting experiments, which he called a little philosophical laughing, Darwin is probably best remembered for his epic poem, The Botanic Garden. In this work and others, he established the foundation for the theory of evolution over half a century before his grandson, Charles, wrote on the origin of species. Leaving the museum, the trail takes us into Chamberlain Square, overlooked by statues of two other prominent lunar men. James Watt is portrayed leaning on the cylinder of his dramatically more powerful and efficient steam engine. It was a concept he developed in Glasgow, 
but he could not find the necessary financial support. As a result, he came to Birmingham to begin a lifelong partnership with Matthew Bolton. Nearby stands Joseph Priestley, shown conducting the experiment which discovered deflogisticated air, or, as we know it, oxygen. Totally absorbed in his work, he directs the sun's rays through a lens onto a crucible containing mercury oxide, from which he collects the gas in an inverted test tube. A preacher, as well as a chemist, Priestley's radical sympathies aroused the anger of the Birmingham mob, and after a dinner to celebrate Bastille Day in 1791, they burnt down Priestley's home and laboratories. Priestley left Birmingham in disgust and never returned. The next point on the Lunar Trail is the iconic Library of Birmingham. Its unique archives include more than 550 volumes of letters, books and accounts from the Bolton and Watt partnership and 29,000 drawings of Watt's painstaking improvements to the steam engine. Meanwhile, the men themselves are portrayed nearby, looking at the mechanical drawings of an engine with William Murdoch, a highly skilled engineer and inventor employed by Bolton and Watt. From the statue, the trail now enters the system of canals in which members of the lunar societies such as Wedgwood invested. Bolton and other Birmingham manufacturers used these waterways to ship their goods throughout Britain and across the globe. The trail follows the towpath to the assay office, where silver items received the famous Birmingham anchor hallmark. Initially, Birmingham's thriving silverware trade had been hampered because the town had no assay office. Bolton addressed this issue with typical energy. He successfully organised a petition to Parliament and in 1773, Birmingham's first assay office opened above the King's Head Inn and Bolton was its first customer. Its current premises were opened in 1878 and it is now the busiest assay office in the world. Moving across the jewellery quarter, the trail reaches St Paul's Church, where both Bolton and Watt worshipped and where one of Bolton's senior employees, Francis Edgington, created the beautiful stained glass window portraying the conversion of St Paul. Bolton would have travelled here from Soho House, the fine home he built in nearby Hansworth. Nowhere on the trail do we come closer to the lunar men than in these carefully restored rooms. It was around this table that Bolton and his friends spent many moonlit evenings conducting experiments, debating ideas and marvelling at the newest scientific instruments. Afterwards, letters flew from one to another and were often sent to famous friends overseas, such as Benjamin Franklin, who had visited Birmingham and Soho. Less than a mile from Bolton's home is the Soho Foundry. This was the world's first purpose-built steam engine factory and from here they shipped their revolutionary rotary engines to mills and factories throughout the world. Today, the buildings are in a sad state because of damage inflicted during the Second World War. Finally, the trail visits Bolton and Watts Parish Church of St Mary's in Handsworth, where they are both buried. Inside the church, the marble bust of Matthew Bolton includes an engraving of the Soho Manufactory where he produced toys, silverware and ormolu. Nearby is the James Watt Memorial Chapel, with a fine marble statue. But perhaps these are not the finest or most impressive monuments to these lunar men. To find this, we go to the ultra-modern think tank. Here we can stand in awe before Bolton and Watt's Smethic engine, the magnificent machine which helped power the Industrial Revolution. In many ways, this captures the legacy of the Lunar Society. They were a group of friends who were bound together by the excitement of science, driven by the possibilities of new technologies, and immersed in the desire to understand the world. And in doing so, they changed our world forever.
So join us on the Lunar Trail here in Birmingham and explore the men who made the modern world. To download a map of the Lunar Trail, visit the History West Midlands website. Free to view films on Bolton and other members of the Lunar Society are also available on the site. Welcome back to Cityscape. In today's episode of Secret People, we will cover Jack Parsons, a rocket engineer, chemist, and Thelemite occultist. Rocket science is one of the most difficult disciplines there is. One would expect leaders in that industry to be empirical, stoic, and perhaps hyper-rational. But the man featured in this episode was no such thing. For example, when looking for tenants for his Pasadena home, Jack boldly asserted in the ad, quote, only bohemians, artists, musicians, atheists, anarchists, or any other exotic types need to apply for rooms. Any mundane soul would be unceremoniously rejected, end quote. Judging by this ad, one would not think Parsons was central to the U.S. early rocket programs in the 1930s and 40s, but that he was, and much more. As always, let's start with a brief background. Marvel Whiteside Parsons was born on October 2, 1914, in Los Angeles, California. Parsons was named after his father, Marvel H. Parsons, a wealthy real estate developer in Springfield, Massachusetts. His mother, Ruth Virginia Whiteside, divorced his father after discovering her husband was visiting prostitutes. No longer wanting her son to remind her of her former husband, she refused to call him Marvel and always referred to him as Jack. This name would stick with him forever. At the age of 12, Parsons attended Washington Junior High School, where he developed a friendship with Edward Foreman. These two shared an interest in rocketry and would begin engaging in homemade rocket experiments using gunpowder. Despite being only 12, Parsons also began to investigate the occult and even performed the ritual to invoke the devil into his bedroom. With the onset of the Great Depression in 1931, the Parsons family fortune began to dwindle. By now, Parsons was attending the university school, where he was a keen participant in archery and fencing. Parsons graduated high school in 1933 and enrolled at Pasadena Junior College to get an associate's degree in chemistry and physics. He dropped out after one term due to financial hardship and took up full-time employment at the Hercules Powder Company. He later began a degree in chemistry at Stanford University, but found the tuition unbearable, so he returned to Pasadena. Things began to take a turn for Parsons when he and his childhood friend, Edward Foreman, attended a lecture by aerospace engineer Theodore von Karman. The two approached von Karman after the lecture, and Karman introduced them to Frank Molina, a mathematician and mechanical engineer from Texas, writing a PhD thesis on rocket propulsion. The three became friends and would apply for funding to do rocket research together at Caltech. Caltech agreed for the group to operate under the university's Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory, which gave them access to special equipment. The three focused on their distinct skill for their collaborative rocket development. Parsons was the chemist, Foreman, the machinist, and Melina, the theoretical technician. Around the same time, Parsons also met Helen Northrup, a woman he met at a local church dance, and proposed marriage in 1934. Parsons, Foreman, and Melina would be known among the campus as the Suicide Squad because of their dangerously explosive experiments. After countless tinkering, the group tested their first liquid fuel jet motor at the Devil's Gate Dam in the Arroyo Seco in 1936. Three attempts to fire the rocket failed, and the fourth one resulted in a mild explosion. The groups continued their experiments through the last quarter of 1936, and finally completed a successful test in January 1937. By 1938, the group had completed their first static rocket motor, which could burn and run for over a minute. In 1939, a friend invited Jack and his wife Helen to the Church of Thelema 
a religion founded by Aleister Crowley. The couple saw the performance of the Gnostic Mass and were impressed enough to want to join a church. Jack and Helen were both initiated into the lodge in 1941. Parsons' stature would rise in a lodge, and he was later made its head by Aleister Crowley himself. Parsons would become a dedicated student of Crowley and expand the lodge by recruiting new members. Meanwhile, Frank Molina approached the National Academy of Science for funding to research jet propulsion. The military was interested in jet propulsion as a means of getting aircraft quickly airborne where there was insufficient room for a full runway. They gave the group an initial funding of $1,000 to research the feasibility of jet-assisted takeoff. This made Parsons and his group the first government-sanctioned rocket research group in U.S. history. The proposal led to more funding, and by 1940, the rocket research group at Caltech was given $22,000 for their experiments. By then, fellow scientists at Caltech were getting irritated by the group's dangerous and loud experiments, so they were forced to relocate to iron sheds at the Devil's Dam area. The group's aim was to find a replacement for the black powder rocket motors the military currently used. Parsons invented a solid fuel consisted of amide, cornstarch, and ammonium nitrate. The first JADO test took place in 1941, but was a failure. The units frequently exploded and damaged the aircraft. After a few improvisations made by Parsons, the second test proved a success and reduced takeoff distance by 30%. As a result, the NAS increased their grant to 125000 As the U.S. entered the Second World War, the U.S. Army agreed to buy 60 JATO engines from the group, not just their fuel. As a result, the Suicide Squad formed the Aerojet Engineering Corporation in March 1942. By then, Parsons was extremely well-respected in a rocket science community. Parsons would also make further improvisation in his fuel by combining a mixture of potassium perchlorate with roofing tar. This formulated a better version known as Galset 53. This fuel was not only significantly more stable, but burned slower and provided a thrust that was 427% more powerful than previous versions on the market. Variants of the solid fuel designed by Parsons were later used by NASA and space shuttle rocket boosters to get a man to the moon. Aerojet's first contract was from the U.S. Navy. The Bureau of Aeronautics also requested Parsons' solid fuel type, and the Army Air Corps soon followed. This newfound credential and financial success gave Parsons the opportunity to travel throughout the U.S. as an ambassador for Aerojet. He met with rocket enthusiasts, like Carl Germer, and had several hour-long conversations with Werner von Braun. Parsons was even called upon to give expert testimony in a state prosecution murder trial. Captain Earl Connett and Lieutenant Roy Allen and Fred Brown of the LAPD were accused of murdering a vice squad officer called Harry Raymond by placing a pipe bomb in his car. Raymond had been investigating political corruption within the police department and was about to expose them. The trial lasted several months and made headline news in all the national newspapers. As a result, and due to Parsons' expert testimony, all three were found guilty and convicted for the murder. This is a famous picture of Parsons holding a mock replica of the pipe bomb used in a killing. The replica was created by Parsons himself. This trial caused Parson to become acknowledged as America's leading expert on explosives. Back at the lodge, Parsons got involved with his wife's 17-year-old sister, Betty Sarah. Not caring too much about Helen's feelings, Sarah began to assert herself as Parsons' new wife. The couple, along with other Thelemites, moved to 1000 South Orange Grove Boulevard, a mansion where the Thelema religious followers lived in a commune. One person that would later rent a room in this mansion is L. Ron Hubbard. I have already discussed how L. Ron Hubbard would screw Parsons in another episode, so I will not get into the details here. Aerojet was valued at $150,000, or $2.3 million today. 
We can see that various battles, especially on the Pacific front, are won precisely because Jack Parsons was in the Arroyo blowing shit up, taking this into Caltech and then figuring out a way to mass produce these jet assisted takeoff units. During the war, Jack and his colleagues are making money hand over fist, and Jack takes that wealth and bankrolls his obsession with Thelema, a new religious movement founded by the renowned English occultist Alistair Crowley. It's really important to understand that Parsons had been interested supposedly since high school in these metaphysical questions and maintained at one point that he had done an invocation in high school that had scared him so much that he stopped for years because he felt that he, he personally was too powerful. I think a lot of the occult rituals that they perform have to do with invoking the imagination, the fantasy, and so on. They both have to do with creating worlds that are different than the mainstream world we live in. So I think there's a lot that the similar type of personality would be interested in both of those things. He rents numerous rooms in his 19-room mansion out to anyone as long as they don't believe in God and conducts occult rituals involving chanting, black robes, and group sex. Eventually, L. Ron Hubbard finds himself at one of Jack's ragers and the two become fast friends. Yes, this is the same L. Ron Hubbard who would go on to found Scientology. Elron and Jack spend days conducting a series of invocations that they call the Babylon Working. They follow chants and rituals created by Crowley. With Elron as note taker, Jack then proceeds to masturbate in front of him, all in hopes of calling forth a yet unknown woman. Following their desert trip, Jack and Elron's relationship quickly sours after Hubbard cons Jack out of $10,000 and steals his girlfriend. After losing both his money and girlfriend to Hubbard, Parsons began to engage in black magic in an attempt to recover his losses. He also met Marjorie Cameron, a woman he would later marry and be with for practically the rest of his life. Parsons was an habitual user of marijuana, but he now regularly used cocaine, amphetamines, and various other opiates. Meanwhile, Aerojet was now operating a budget of 650000 and the jet fuel operations were also growing. Parsons would come to work high from drugs and exhausted from occult rituals, and his co-workers noticed. As the U.S. became aware that Nazi Germany had developed the V-2 rocket, the military gave the group a $3 million grant to develop rocket-based weapons. This expansion led the group to rename their Caltech Rocket Research Group into Jet Propulsion Laboratory, an organization that is now part of NASA even today. By this point, the Navy was also ordering 20,000 JATO units a month from Aerojet. The administrators, who by then were mostly made up of academics from Caltech, took this traction as an opportunity to sell 51% of the company's stock to General Tire and Rubber Company. They also voted to remove Parsons from the business, viewing his occult activities as disreputable and repulsive. Parsons left the company with just $11,000 despite his critical contributions as a founder and technical pioneer. Affairs would get much worse for Parsons, however. After the Second World War, the Red Scare forced an investigation that caused him to lose his secret clearance due to his communist sympathies in the past. Parsons had to resort to manual labor, working as a car mechanic and bootlegging nitroglycerin for money. After testifying to a federal court, that the Lima was anti-communist, Parsons once again obtained a secret clearance, which allowed him to get a contract designing and constructing a chemical plant for Howard Hughes. While at Hughes Aircraft, he was also working on a project with Israel to design and build a jet propulsion factory. To help with this research, he used his high-level security clearance to access and take home confidential documents. A Hughes Aircraft secretary reported Parsons to the FBI for espionage. Military security was also called in to investigate his early association with von Braun in Germany. Parsons would again lose his secret clearance and be forbidden to work on rocketry. To make a living, Parsons founded the Parsons Chemical Manufacturing Company in 1952, 
which was based in North Hollywood. The company created pyrotechnics and explosives for the film industry. In June that year, Parsons received the rush order of explosives for a film set and began working on it in his home laboratory. While working on that order, Parsons accidentally dropped a concoction of fulminate of mercury, which turned this experiment into his last one. The explosion blew off his right arm. Both of his legs and left arm were broken and a hole was torn on the right side of his face. He was declared dead 37 minutes after the explosion. He was just 37 years old. Upon learning the death of her son, his mother Ruth took a fatal dose of sleeping pills and killed herself. Parsons' legacy includes many patents for liquid and solid fuel for rockets. An exhibit of one of his solid fuel motors is on display at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. How do you think we should redesign schools for, say, kindergarten kids and elementary kids in some practical way? You tend to think practically. What do you, what do you think would be a good start? Well, like in the 50s, when I went to school, we had all kinds of craft projects. I was learning to use little blunt scissors, probably in first grade. Um, I'd be putting all the hands-on classes back into schools, and that's going to include theater music, cooking, sewing. When I went to elementary school, mm -hmm. I loved art, sewing, and woodworking. And if I hadn't had those classes, I would have hated elementary school. And I loved sewing. And when I was in fourth grade, I had a singer so handy, a toy sewing machine that actually sewed, and it was one of my favorite things because I could make things with it. Kids are not doing enough of that kind of stuff today. Right. Okay. So there's a return to the, there's there's a need for a return to the practical on in some sense on both sides of the gender spectrum. On everybody. To tools, on with regards everybody. To sewing with we, and I would now mm. I went when I was doing a book signing for visual thinking. I went to um, a, a physics lab in Harvard. This room's labeled physics lab, and they had all kinds of 3D printers in there. But they also had a sewing machine, and they also had a station for crocheting. And this is the building labeled engineering department at Harvard. Maybe they're realizing they've got to right. get them doing some hands-on things. This is when I did the book signing for this. It was part of the book tour. The other thing I've noticed, I stayed, I got into some interesting places. I stayed at this hotel where, um, where they, so in Evansville, Illinois, where they had uh, textbooks in the rooms from the 1930s. I wish I'd had more time to look at it. And I pulled out an electrical engineering book. And it had a lot of math in it, but it was much more applied. They'd say, well, this is how this the generator works. This is the math that goes with it. But it would describe how the generator actually worked. It was mm -hmm. much more applied. And I, now the physiology book that I had in the 70s. You know, we'll explain how the kidney works, how the heart works, and then explain the chemistry. Now I look at a physiology book, and it's much more verbal, a lot more math and chemistry. But how does the kidney actually work? I still have my old Duke's Physiology of Domestic Animals from 1970. And I want to go back and compare that to the Duke's Physiology now. And, and it's like we're taking the practical out. I just got an email yesterday uh, from the UK that they wanted to take a technology and design course out of a high school. You see, I think this what's happening now is mathematics is totally taking over. Yes, we need mathematics because my kind of mind is not going to touch boilers and refrigeration in that food processing plant. That's a job for the mathematicians. But what we're losing is the object visualizer. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, I wonder... I wonder, too, if part of this is the fact that, you know, for a long time in our society, a lot of this practical machinery just worked. And so we could afford to ignore it in some abstract sense, right? Because our cars worked and our power grids worked and we could take all of this low-level infrastructure for granted. Now, that meant there were a lot of people on the shop floors who were busily working, making sure it worked. But it did mean that we had the luxury to engage in abstract specialization and maybe we could fall prey to the psychological tendency to just dismiss all that. Well, you see, when they first started, about 20 years ago, is when they started taking shop classes out of the schools. 
Well, you can get away with that for a while. And then the people I worked with, I'm gray now, are retiring. They're retiring out and they're not getting replaced. That's happening with elevator and escalator mechanics. That's happening with airplane mechanics. And I'm seeing that more and more and more and more as I travel. These are three things that I see all the time. And they are getting gray. Right, right. So, yeah, the retirement problem is going to be the retirement well, the problem other, is going there, to be a big one. The, Do you, when it comes to industry, there's two gigantic mistakes that were made. Shutting down in-house engineering shops. 20 years ago, we had this huge metal working shop called the Montfort Fab Shop. And it was part of the engineering of a company called Montfort. So they no longer exist now. Well, that's been shut down. And then at the same time, we took out shop classes. Now, in the short run, it was cheaper for these companies to just farm out engineering work they need to do in their plant. Yeah, that works fine until the shops retire out. And now what's happened, like I can't go and na- give you the name of the company, but I have a client right now where the one shop that's left is ripping people off at five times the price. And that's happening right, right now. right. Do you see any positive consequences of computer technology for object visualizers and for the for the people who are working more in the visual spatial end of things? Well, it's definitely useful to, you know, like the visualization and stuff you can do on computers. But that doesn't replace real things. Let me tell you, power grid, I lay awake at night about that. And that's so fragile that I'm not, I'm not going to go into any detail because it's too fragile. And I'm not going to discuss the things that I visualize and lay awake at night about the power grid because it's just okay. too fragile. Um, okay, I'm curious about that. Why not discuss them? Because I'd I don't like want to give them. I don't want to give people that have bad intentions any information on how to hurt the power grid. It's okay, that okay, okay. That's I see. the reason. I see. That yeah, yeah. is the reason. Right. Because it's very easy so to when hurt you- it. And I don't want to give out any information that would help somebody damage the power grid. So I don't discuss the details here. But I'm seeing them right now. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, that's part of that ability to think about critical points of failure well, that there's, is so I, much characteristic I know exactly, of an engineering mind. I know where the critical points of failure are, and I'm not going to discuss them. When they learn something new, and you can just see in their faces... It's such an incredible moment. It's those moments that are my favorite. breaking news out of Florida where crews are working to put out a massive industrial fire there showing you how things look live and man those flames are intense. This is a fire burning in Osceola County about an hour south of Orlando. The ABC station there says five acres of plastic planters caught fire at a nursery. Nobody has been evacuated yet. Of course we will be following the story throughout the morning. We'll keep you posted. Right now, residents in East Palestine, Ohio, are under expanded evacuation orders after a 50-car train derailment. Emergency crews are working to vent toxic chemicals from five cars near the Pennsylvania state line in order to reduce the threat of an explosion. The train derailed Friday night. Has been uh, The wreckage has been smoldering, as you see there, ever since. Norfolk Southern Railway says no crew members, residents, or first responders have been hurt. Chicago tonight, a fire has been put out at a chemical plant after burning for more than five hours. No one was hurt, but people in the area are being warned to not touch a green chemical residue that's been left behind. Officials say it can stain skin. I-10 closing both sides of that freeway east of Tucson due to a hazardous spill. Faye is joining us now with what we know so far. Faye? Yeah, guys, a a shelter-in-place warning now in effect for anyone within a one-mile radius of this crash, which is near the Kolb exit there off of I-10 east of Tucson. Drivers being urged to avoid this area. Brand new video coming in right now from the scene. At the time of the crash, around 3 p.m., winds topped out at 45 miles an hour. Officials say the truck flipped on its side in the 
comedian. Fire crews are on scene working to control the hazardous material. Nitric acid is a major component of fertilizer. It can also be used to make explosives. Now, according to the CDC, exposure to nitric acid can cause irritation to the eyes, the skin, the lining of the mouth, lungs and stomach. Officials urging everyone nearby to turn off their heaters, AC units and any other equipment that may bring in outside air. At this point, there is no estimated time for I-10 to reopen in that area. Officials are on scene deciding if the shelter in place warning should be expanded and we're working to learn more. Any updates, Katie and Javier, we'll get them right out to you. Uh, good morning. I'm Laurie Christensen with Harris County Fire Marshal's Office. Um, I'm going to give you a, a very short brief. We'll be back in about 30 minutes uh, with Harris County Pollution Control and Harris County Public Health. But uh, Chief McAteer from ESD 48 and I did want to give you just a quick brief uh, and we want to thank you for waiting. Chief, you want to start? Yes, uh, we, we received an, an alarm about 8.42 last evening uh, for a leak in a warehouse. And uh, on arrival, we, we, we saw a, an active uh, leak from... Van der Leyen stated that it was paramount to now investigate the Nord Stream pipeline attack and that any deliberate disruption of active European energy is unacceptable and will lead to the strongest possible response. The strongest possible response. Well, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Seymour Hirsch, probably the most legendary investigative journalist alive, just published a report that presents detailed claims that, on President Biden's orders, the US, with Norway's help, blew up the Nord Stream pipelines. Hirsch has a long track record of journalistic integrity. This was a premeditated terrorist attack on European critical infrastructure. It was also environmental terrorism. Does the EU care? Do you need to know who did it? Or do you want to know? Hirsch says the US did it. Did you just ask him? Did you just ask him to do it? Or, or do you just ask them questions anymore? Have we become so subservient has the EU become so subservient to U.S. empire, it just can't even ask them if they did it? Is there a fucking joke?